Hi guys, welcome to this uh, revision video on nuclear fusion. So what we're going to be looking at, uh, we're going to look at the process of nuclear fusion, what it is, how it works. We're looking at these fusion equations. Now, these are not compulsory. These are just some things if you want to go a bit of a higher level, if you want to uh, know what actually happens in nuclear fusion in a bit more detail. We're going to look at where energy comes from in fusion, and we're going to look at the advantages and disadvantages of nuclear fusion too. Okay, so nuclear fusion. Now, it is simplified a lot in this course about what nuclear fusion actually is. This is a bit of an animation to simplify it a bit more for you. So what we've got here, if you look, we've got two protons. Now, protons essentially are a nucleus of a hydrogen atom. So if you take a, a hydrogen atom and you heat it up enough, what you do is you remove the electrons and you will have remaining the nucleus, which if you have hydrogen one, you will have a proton. So if you get these protons together, and if you can get them close enough, what will happen is, kapow, they will join together to make a bigger nucleus. Now that's what fusion is. It's combining together lighter nuclei to make a larger nuclei, or larger nucleus even. Um, that's how you define fusion. Now you may have noticed something a bit weird about what just went on there, because you've got two protons coming together and they make a helium nucleus. So where have those two neutrons come from? A bit weird, we're gonna to come to that in a bit. As I said, we simplify it a lot, just make it easier to understand the GCSE, but I'll go through where they actually come from. Uh, in nuclear fusion though, certain conditions are required because if you've got these two protons, if you wanna get these two protons close enough together, there's a bit of a problem. Protons have a positive charge. So when you have two positive charges coming near each other, there is a force of electrostatic repulsion between them, i.e. two charges that are the same repel each other. So how do you get them close enough together? Because once you do get them close enough together, they will bind together. Well, the way you do that is you heat them up. You give them a lot of kinetic energy. So by heating them up, they start moving faster and therefore they can overcome the electrostatic repulsion. It's like saying if you have two bar magnets and they repel each other, well, if you push them with enough force, if you get them moving fast enough, you will be able to get them touching each other. What happens is, and this is going to a bit of A level, when they get close enough together, this force called the strong nuclear force, which is a very, very short range, but a very strong force, will start to act and it will bring them together. And then it will bind them to make a large nucleus and release energy like this. Kapow! Um, so we'll come to the steps in a second. But fusion, where it naturally occurs, in stars. Things like the sun, they once thought that the sun was producing energy by coal burning and then they started to realise actually that didn't make sense. The amount of coal you'd need would be absurd for how long they thought the sun would be burning for in the past. So fusion is happening in stars and the thing that brings it close enough together the, and the protons close enough together is gravity. Now stars take millions and millions of years to actually form themselves. So gravity starts to bring uh, dust and gas together in space, in nebulas, and that slowly starts to heat it up over millions of years. And once it's hot enough, fusion will start to occur. When you get onto space topic a bit more, we talk about the life cycle of a star, but fusion is what produces energy in a star by combining smaller nuclei into larger nuclei. The simplest form of fusion is turning hydrogen into helium. But in stars, if it's hot enough, you can combine other nuclei into large nuclei, which is how other heavy elements are formed. So elements heavier than hydrogen can be fused together to make elements heavier than that. The only condition is you need very high temperatures to do that and bigger stars. Another condition that you need as well is high pressures, which is where the gravitational field of a larger star would be able to pull them together, potentially even when a star is collapsing as well. But we'll come on to that more when we get on to the next topic. Um, we have managed fusion on Earth. One of the places we've managed it is actually in Oxfordshire at JET. Fusion is possible, we've managed to do it. What they actually do is they use things like magnetic fields and microwaves as well to contain this plasma, this uh, the protons that are used in fusion. Because once they start touching the outside walls of this, this tokamak, um, they start losing energy. Once you start losing the heat, the particles then will be able to repel each other once again. There is a bit of a problem with this though. The problem is 
because we need to heat this up to a high temperature in order for it to work, in order for the particles to overcome their electrostatic repulsion, because we need to put that much energy into it in the first place, we actually get less energy out via the fusion reaction. So at the minute, we put more energy in than we get out. So fusion at the minute isn't really viable. It doesn't really work as such, as in it, there's no point doing it. So scientists are trying to work out, is there a way that we can do it where we get more energy out than we put in, i.e. there's net energy production. Um, there are lots of people trying to research this. Lots of people are trying to research this thing called cold fusion, which essentially is fusion at room temperature. So fusion where we don't need to put that amount of energy in in order to start the reaction. Two scientists did originally think that they had sorted cold fusion, but at the end of the day, they couldn't reproduce the work, which is what scientists do. They have to reproduce the work in order to show others that it does work. They couldn't reproduce it, so claim that actually it never worked. So uh, we've got to the process of nuclear fusion. So small nuclei into larger ones using high temperature and high pressure to overcome the electrostatic repulsion. Now let's look at that problem using fusion equations. So actually when we talk about combining hydrogen into helium for the simplest type of fusion, we are not talking about just hydrogen on its own. We're talking about possible isotopes of hydrogen. So if you remember, isotopes are atoms of the same element with the same number of protons, but a different number of neutrons. So if you look here, what happens is actually if you combine two uh, hydrogen ones, hydrogen one is essentially where you just have the proton. So if you combine two hydrogen one nuclei together, they will fuse and one of the protons will turn into a neutron, which makes this over here. This is called deuterium. So deuterium is an isotope of hydrogen where it's got a proton and a neutron. So therefore an isotope, it's got a different number of neutrons, but the same number of protons. So there are lots of different ways that fusion can happen, but here is one of the examples. So if you have two protons coming together, they will fuse and it will turn one of the protons into a neutron, making deuterium. If you then have deuterium that combines together with a regular um, hydrogen atom where you've just got one proton, they will combine together and they will produce this. Now this here has got two protons and one neutron. This here is a helium isotope. So normally helium has two protons and two neutrons. This one has got two protons and one neutron. This is a helium isotope. And that process, when you fuse them together, will release a massive amount of energy in the form of electromagnetic radiation, mainly light and heat. And then the next step, if you have two helium-3 nuclei and they come together, what can happen is they will produce a helium-4 nucleus, which we're normally familiar with. And by the way, you may have noticed the error, that should be two. Um, and they will produce energy and they will give off some protons as well. So actually you will have two of these, two of these hydrogen nuclei there. And those hydrogen nuclei will then go on to fuse again. It might be that they combine together to make um, hydrogen to a deuterium. There are lots of different ways that fusion can happen, but that is one of the examples of how it actually does happen. You don't need to remember this. It's not compulsory. It's just a bit of optional there if you wanted to look at the high levels, uh, the more detail of how fusion actually works. So where does the energy actually come from fusion? Well, this is the same as fission. Some of the mass in the, uh, the protons and neutrons, when they combine together, they do produce, that they are combined, converted even to make energy. So if you take um, protons on their own and you measure their mass, and then if you combine them together and they're joined together in a nucleus, if you measure the mass of the nucleus, it's actually different to the mass of the separate protons and neutrons. In fact, it's lighter because some of the mass has been converted into energy. Einstein famously had this equation where you can calculate the energy transfer uh, of mass and vice versa. So the mass, if you times that by the speed of light in a vacuum squared, which is three times 10 to the eight meters a second, you can work out the equivalent amount of energy released in that reaction. So that's where the energy comes from. Again, just a very simple one mile recall for that. Uh, the advantages and disadvantages of nuclear fusion. Well, very similar to fission in a way that no greenhouse gases are produced. That's a really good thing. Won't lead to things like global warming. 
no dangerous products produced. Now, what I mean by that is the only product that's really produced is helium, and that's not dangerous at all. It's the noble gas, uh, no problems with that whatsoever. Things like burning coal, you may release poisonous gases, carbon monoxide, uh, lots of things that you don't really want to release, as well as greenhouse gases. So helium is the only byproduct that's dangerous. The fuel is easily available. All we literally need is hydrogen and isotopes of hydrogen. And we have got a plentiful supply of hydrogen in the case of water. So all we need to do is extract the hydrogen from the water, maybe using something like electrolysis and potentially a lot of energy created. I mean, that point's not really a great one, considering the fact that we can't get it to work. But if you look at something like the sun, I mean, potentially there, there's a massive amount of energy that's released, and that's where all life comes from on Earth, or all energy comes from, things like coal, wind, etc. Potentially there is a lot of energy that could be created. Uh, one thing I've also seen as well as an advantage of fusion is that if the reaction um, maybe starts to produce a lot of energy, you can disable it, providing the reaction is small. I mean, for example, on the star, uh, on a star, the way that energy is produced is via gravity, so you can't just get rid of mass. But in some another tokamak from before, all you need to do is stop supplying the heat, stop supplying the magnetic field, and it can stop the fusion reaction straight away. Disadvantages. Well, there aren't really that many disadvantages, apart from the big one of the fact that it just doesn't really work at the minute in the fact that we're putting more energy in than we're getting out. So the major disadvantage of fusion is that there's no net energy production. Apart from that, it's pretty good, which is why we're so interested and why at the minute the scientific community are racing to try and find what they need to do to get fusion to work. So that's it for nuclear fusion and that is it for P4. Enjoy. See you next time.